our lives begin again today. As the world around us constantly renews itself, so we come here to this place to renew our spiritual lives. May we learn to re-enliven our faith, faith in our God incarnated within all we know as life. May we learn to rekindle our sense of hope, hope in all human possibilities for the betterment of the world in which we live. May we learn to reinvigorate our capacity for love, the love that animates our souls and makes life worth living. Let this be our aspiration for today. With these opening words by the late Reverend Vernon Marshall, I welcome you to this Sunday service at Kensington Unitarian Church. Welcome to those here in the room and welcome to those who join us online from elsewhere. For those who don't know me, I'm Stephanie Bisbee. I suppose I should say Reverend Stephanie Bisbee, though I'm not really one for formalities. It's a great pleasure to be here in person with you today and to have my husband Steve with me. I first visited Kensington online during lockdown and have been very much inspired by the wonderful work you and Jane have done to create such successful hybrid services. I've had the privilege of co-leading services with Pat Patricia and Janine remotely in both time and space. I first visited you in person for Jane's induction service, but this is the first time I've stood here as a worship leader. So I hope you'll bear with me if anything differs from your usual pattern. The theme I have chosen for today picks up on something which has been much on my mind this month. The 13th to the 19th of May was Mental Health Awareness Week, an event which I know you've already marked. And the theme the organisers chose this year was movement, moving more for our mental health. As someone who loves to dance and doesn't do nearly enough of it, I found myself pondering why dance might be as important to our spiritual health as our mental health, and reflecting on the ways in which dance acts as a metaphor for life. And I thought I'd bring you some of those reflections today. This feels doubly appropriate since dance has been a big part of my connection with your minister, Jane. We've swapped commentary on Strictly Come Dancing on Facebook over the years and demonstrated various dances together at summer school. To my sadness, I've never managed to join one of your inclusive tea dances, but I know there is one coming up. So for very many reasons, this seems a perfect time to reflect on the spiritual significance of movement. As Unitarians, our worship can be more static than some denominations, but there is one small but important action which unites most of our churches and chapels the world over and that is lighting the chalice flame, the symbol of our free religious faith. So today, I light our chalice with words inspired by Wendell Berry and Sarah Moores Campbell. We light this chalice in honour of life's sacred dance of living and dying. May its flame remind us of those who have passed to us fragments of holiness. May it remind us that we too are participants in the dance. I now invite you to join in singing our first hymn and please stand or sit as you would feel most comfortable for Spirit of Life, Come Unto Me. It's 148 in the Purple Book and we will sing it twice through because it's very short. Hymn number 148.
Let's take our joys and concerns, spoken and unspoken, now into an extended time of reflection. You might want to adjust your position for comfort. Close your eyes, soften your gaze. Perhaps there is a posture that helps you feel more prayerful. Whether that is hands folded, heads bowed, or something entirely different. Whatever works for you to get into the right state of body and mind for us to be fully present here and now in this sacred time and space with ourselves, with each other and with that which is both within us and beyond us. Divine Spirit, healer of my hurts, consoler of my sorrows, vibrant light of happiness, bertha of all life and gentle way of death, hear my prayer. I raise my heart to you as do the ancient redwoods rooted in the ground, swaying in the wind. I praise and thank you for my life, gifts of body and essence, strength to bear life's burdens, grace to dance life's joys. I praise and thank you for my life, Gifts of eyes and heart that fill with beauty smiling or with pain and sadness weeping. I praise and thank you for my life. Gifts of ears to hear words of grace and wisdom, to listen to and lighten the burdens of others. I praise and thank you for my life. My voice to sing out praises to speak my truths and visions, to share myself with others. I praise and thank you for my life, gifts of all my senses, rhythm of my heartbeat, rise and fall of my breathing, the will to live with passion, serenity, joy, Spirit, guide me to a deeper knowing of your presence in the world. Show me the deeper meanings of the patterns of my years. Help me regard myself and others with eyes of calm compassion. Teach me to learn patience with their failings and my own. Help me accept the mould and fashion of my life through marching years. In the names of all who perceive your transcendent presence in trees and brooks and mountains, in work and play and resting, in all moments and places between. Amen and blessed be. Well, those words of prayer referenced voices to sing praises and that's what we're going to do now our second hymn is number 26 dancing sweetheart and it's not terribly well known so andrew is going to play the whole verse through for us number 26 dancing sweetheart <laughs>
two short readings now, and they're going to be read for us by Sonia and Brian, so I'm going to go and sit down. This is a reading called The Divine Dance by Richard Rohr. In the pages that follow, I'm going to simply circle around this most paradoxical idea about the nature of God. And in truth, circling around is actually an apt metaphor for this mystery that we're trying to apprehend. There is no other way to appreciate mystery. Remember, mystery isn't something that you cannot understand. It is something that you can endlessly understand. There is no point at which you can say, I've got it. Always and forever, mystery gets you. Circling around is all we can do. Our speaking of God is a search for similes, analogies, and metaphors. All theological language is an approximation offered tentatively in holy awe. That's the best human language can achieve. We can say, it's like, it's similar to, but we can never say, it is, because we are in the realm of beyond, of transcendence, of mystery. And we must maintain a fundamental humility before the great mystery. If we do not, religion always worships itself and its formulations and never God. The very mystical Cappadocian fathers of fourth century Turkey developed some highly sophisticated thinking on what we soon called the Trinity. It took three centuries of reflection on the gospels to have the courage to say it. But they of this land, which included Paul of Tarsus and Mevlana Rumi, circled around to the best metaphor they could find. Whatever is going on in God is a flow, a radical relatedness, a perfect union between three, a circle dance of love. And God is not just a dancer, God is the dance itself. Bigger Than Alone by Stuart Coop. You dance in circles, I dance in squares. You keep rhythm. I go here, I go there. You dance alone. I have community. You dance with grace. I rise and fall awkwardly. Though we dance a different dance, directions are both home. We chant a different chorus, and the words may be unknown. But together, we are bigger, bigger than alone. You sing like choirs, I sing a dirge. Your words are poetry, I mumble the absurd. Your harmony uplifts, I complain and moan. You hold an audience, I barely hold my own. Though we dance a different dance, directions are both home. We chant a different chorus, and the words may be unknown. But together we are bigger, bigger than alone. And your religion doesn't look too much like mine. At least on the face of it. But given more time to strip away the chaff, and get down to the bone. Travelling together, we are bigger than alone.
Thank you so much to both readers for bringing those readings to life for us. Um, Richard Rohr is, I think, a fairly well-known religious writer, though perhaps one Unitarians don't often turn to. I didn't know anything at all about Stuart Coop until very recently. I found that poem, which I absolutely adore, in a collection called Waiting to be Discovered, and I was recently told that Stuart is or was a member at our Horsham Unitarian Chapel. So I have a context for him now, which pleases me. But I love those words. Travelling together, we are bigger than alone. We move back into a time of meditation now, and I'm going to share a short poem by William Stafford called Time for Serenity, Anyone, which describes a meditative moment as the poet is drawn into an awareness of his own vitality by the sound of water and the feel of fresh air in his lungs. The poem will take us into a few minutes of shared silence, which will end with the sound of a bell, and then we'll hear some music for meditation. So once again, let's do what we need to do to get comfortable. Adjust your position if you need to. Maybe close your eyes. The words and music are, of course, just an offering. Feel free to use the time to meditate in your own way. I like to live in the sound of water, in the feel of mountain air. A sharp reminder hits me. This world still is alive. It stretches out there shivering towards its own creation and I'm part of it. Even my breathing enters into the elaborate give and take, this bowing to sun and moon, day or night, winter, summer, storm, still, this tranquil chaos that seems to be going somewhere, this wilderness with a great peacefulness in it, this motionless turmoil, this everything dance.
I must confess, when it came to choosing my first reading today, I had a few doubts about the wisdom of picking a piece of writing by a Franciscan priest, no matter how widely loved Father Richard Raw is. And just to make it worse, I wasn't picking any old piece of his writing either, but part of the core thesis of his most determinedly Trinitarian work. Here I was, preparing to preach for the first time in this most Unitarian of settings, the home of Unitarian legend Theophilus Lindsay, and my main reading was going to be the heart of a defence of the Trinity. Oops. So I was very glad, watching one of your recent services on YouTube, to hear Jane say, I suspect most of us gathered here today are not nearly as worried about the differences between Unitarian and Trinitarian theology as our forebears were. Or at least, it's not such a burning and prominent question in most of our minds. Thanks, Jane. That made me feel much better. Maybe it doesn't matter if I'm being a bit accidentally Trinitarian, because I agree that it's more about the approach we have to life's big questions and our commitment to an ongoing, ever-unfolding process of religious discovery, an honest search for truth and meaning, and a sincere quest to live good and virtuous lives, to help bring about justice, peace, and a better world for all. The aspect of Father Orr's work I wanted to bring out isn't so much his view of the Trinity itself, as it is the idea of unfolding process. A very brief and not terribly good summary of Orr's excellent book, The Divine Dance, would be, God isn't a person, God is a relationship. And the three parts of the Trinity represent the changing patterns of relatedness at the heart of God. Of course, neither Trinity nor dance really represents God fully, because the whole idea of God, whatever he or she or it might be, is something too big to be fully captured by human consciousness or human language. That's why metaphor is vital to religious understanding. And I suppose that's always also why poetry has, for me, always been such an important part of my faith. From the Song of Songs, to Rumi, to Gerard Manley Hopkins, poets have said the things that are hard to express in any other way, in words that speak directly to the heart, bypassing the intellect almost entirely. Richard Raw, speaking of the metaphors of the dove or the wind representing the Holy Spirit, reminds us that all religious language is metaphor and points to the Greek origins of the word, meaning to carry across a meaning, to get it from one place to another, from the writer's head to the readers or the speakers to the listeners. How delightful! that the word metaphor is itself a metaphor and one with its roots in physical movement, just like the divine dance. So metaphors are vital to religious understanding, but more than that, the metaphors we choose can affect our whole perception of the world. If your life is a battlefield, you're going to spend a lot of time living on the defensive. If it's a law court, you may be less violent, but just as oppositional. If it's a chess game, you might have fun with your opponent, but they're still not really on your side. Which is quite different to life is a symphony and you're one of many performers working to create harmony. And if life is a dance, what would that mean? Perhaps it says we have to be willing to participate in the dance of life, to step onto the floor, to take the role of leader or follower. Maybe it means that life is meant to be joyful more often than not, or that we are meant to express ourselves as we move through life, to advance and retreat in time with an inner rhythm, to interact with the people around us in accordance with a complex set of rules. Perhaps the most important thing it means to me is that life is full of intricate patterns, that our days are shaped by a complex choreography we don't always fully understand. 
The interplay between part and whole is captured brilliantly by the Irish poet W.B. Yeats in the final stanza of his poem, Among School Children. Labour is blossoming or dancing where the beauty is not bruised to pleasure soul, nor beauty born out of its own despair, nor blear-eyed wisdom out of midnight oil. O chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O body swayed to music, O brightening glance, how can we know the dancer? from the dance. Yeats dances between two metaphors here, that of a person moving to music and that of a plant growing or flourishing. The interplay between two images, the dance of imagery, if you like, brings a depth and a complexity that either image alone could not have done. Labour is blossoming like a flower or dancing expressing itself in joyful physical movement, where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul, where physicality is positive expression and not painful struggle. Those who read one of your recent book group choices, Devon Price's Laziness Does Not Exist, might find the last line of the first quartet particularly resonant, condemning the need to burn the midnight oil to extract blear-eyed wisdom. I can practically feel the grit under my eyelids as I read that line. And I can just as much feel the tension drifting away with the final couplet as my body remembers the feeling of swaying gently to music. And sure enough, with that memory, my view on life, my glance, if you like, brightens. But probably the last line is the most fascinating. How can we know the dancer from the dance? Like most good poetry, it's been read in many different ways. Some critics see it reflecting the intricate relationship between the artist and their art. But others, including Santosh Paul writing in Studies, an Irish quarterly review, thinks it relates to a much wider concept. Yeats, you may know, was endlessly fascinated with folklore and mysticism. And Yeats, Santosh Paul says, sees the dance as the rhythmic process of the universe cosmic and microcosmic both. The dancer and dance are inseparable, as the person and their soul are inseparable, as God and creation are inseparable, as we cannot exist without the universe we inhabit, and the universe is meaningless without our consciousness observing it. For many years, I read Stuart Coop's words, together we are bigger, bigger than alone, as a metaphor for the workings of the Unitarian community, and of course it is. Our congregations are more than the sum of all their individuals, and our movement is more than the sum of its congregations. But it turns out I was only picking up a small portion of the weight Stuart's metaphor carries. Reading the poem again in the light of Roar and Yeats, I realised I was missing the fact that the dance metaphor goes much further one congregation is bigger than a person, but step that up, and the world is more than the sum of all its communities and congregations. Step up again, and the universe is more than the sum of all its worlds, suns, moons, and stars. Like William Stafford's Everything Dance and Richard Rohr's Circle Dance of Love, Coop's dancers and Yeats's are a metaphor for the processes at the heart of life. Breath, growth, response to stimulus. To live fully, we must be willing, not just to move, but to be moved. To let the energy at the heart of things tug us forward, out of ourselves, and into a wider community of people and things. We travel in each other's company, and in the company of all living things. As William Stafford wrote, this world still is alive. It stretches out there, shivering towards its own creation. And I'm part of it. And as Stuart Coop so beautifully reminded us, travelling together 
we are bigger than alone. Let's sing together now the words of our final song, Let It Be a Dance, which is number 88 in the Purple Hymn Book. Let it be a dance. Has our announcements. Right, today's announcements. Thank you for Stephanie from coming down from Yorkshire to lead our service today. Thank you to Ramona for tech hosting. Thank you to Jean for Zoom hosting. Uh, a thanks to Andrew on keyboards, Avi on cello, Benji on vocals for all our music today. And thanks to Sonia for her reading. Thanks to Pat and John for coffee and tea. Coffee, tea, conversation and biscuits are served in the hall outside after the service. If you're on Zoom, then please do stay for a chat with Janine. If you read the book for this month's Better World Book Club, that's meeting at 7.30 tonight. Contact Jane for the link if you haven't already got it. And please do pick up a flyer if you're here in person, as we've lined up all the books until August. Next month, the group will be reading The Book of Forgiving by Desmond Mfo Tutu. We have our regular online heart and soul contemplative spiritual gathering next Friday at 7 o'clock. This week's session is entitled Help. We gather for sharing and prayer and it is a great way to get to know others on a deeper level. Sign up with Jane to book your place if you're interested in heart and soul. 
Next Sunday, we hope that Jane will be back to lead us when our service is titled Out of Our Hands. And next Sunday, there are activities after the service when Many Voices Singing Group with Gaynor and Tatty will be here, followed by the return after a long absence of the tea dance. This is led by Rachel Sparks. Do come along, even if you're left-footed. Support these events and tell your friends if you can. Details of all these activities are printed on the back of your service sheet and also in the Friday emails. Please do sign up for the mailing list if you haven't already done so. The congregation very much has a life beyond Sunday mornings. We encourage you to keep in touch, look out for each other, and do what you can to nurture supportive connections. I hand back now to Stephanie for our final words. Closing words today are a poem by Jan Berry and then some short words of benediction inspired by that poem. The poem is titled Dance on the Edge. Dance on the edge, for that is where God calls us. To understand what wonders faith can bring, searching and learning, risking what befalls us, we make our lives a joyful offering. Dance in your dreams, for that is where God leads us, revealing wisdom, weaving hopes and plans, playing with patterns, shaping what redeems us. She brings to birth new life caught in her hands. Dance through your tears, for that is where God holds us, in all our frailty, weeping and despair. We cling in terror, yet her love enfolds us, till through our pain we find new strength to share. Dance in your heart, for that is where God meets us, place of belonging, laughing in the light, speaking our names, in love she gently greets us, bringing us home to live in love's delight. So in the week ahead, may you dance on the edge, for that is unavoidable in these uncertain times. May you dance in your dreams, for that is what makes us human and brings us life. May you dance through your tears, for tears are inevitable in this precious, fragile world of ours. May you dance in your heart, hand in hand, with God, or whoever or whatever spirit is for you. And through the dance, may you be brought home to live in love's delight. Amen. <laughs>